So welcome to today's webinar resident series, Protocol Procedure and Patient Acceptance with Implant Dentures. It is being presented by Tremaine Watkins, CDT, Clinical Director of Guided Surgery Implant Solutions. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Adam Dreyfus, Director of University, Government, and Institutions. Take it away, Adam. Oh, good morning. Thank you so much, Jessica, for your warm welcome. And good morning to everybody that is joining us. I know that the weather is definitely having an impact on people getting in today. Um, I hope you're all staying safe and dry and above all else, um, staying healthy. The first thing I just want to say is thank you so much. Myself, Jessica, Tremaine, NDX overall, just really appreciates your support, your partnership, and we really do look forward to being your partner for today, tomorrow, and for the future. I know that we have different people joining us from different parts of New York. We actually have some people joining us from out of state as well as we look to continue to expand this program. So I thank you all for your attendance and your time as we really do do this for you. Um, please know that we are open to any suggestions that you might have. Um, as we want to curtail this to your learning and any topics that you might be interested in, please do not hesitate to reach out to myself, Jessica, or Tremaine uh, at any time as we look to evolve this program um, moving forward for your for the next group of residents. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tremaine Watkins. Tremaine, take it away, my friend. Morning, everybody. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, acrylic supported uh, or acrylic based implant supported full arch restorations, you know, sometimes called all on X. We're going to talk about two basic classes of prosthetics, over dentures and hybrids. Um, I realized when I was thinking about this presentation that in doing this, it leaves out a lot of different materials. But I think what it does is in an hour, it gives us kind of a framework for thinking about how do we use full arch implant supported restorations in our case, in our practices. So uh, if you have any questions going along, as everyone said, please feel free to uh, use the chat box. Here we go. So an overdenture is a removable, removable prosthetic that is supported by two or more dental implants for our purposes. Um, as you guys know, they can be supported by teeth like a Q-cell denture or something like that, or even you'll sometimes see root attachments where uh, Cuspids get endowed and a locator is bonded to place. Um, when I started back in the 80s, we used to do more of those. Uh, today, with root form implants being so predictable, uh, we tend to use a root form implant to support the attachment. Um, we're going to talk today both about bar retained over dentures, like you see in the picture here, and then over dentures retained by individual implants. An acrylic hybrid is the most common type of screw retained implant supported full arch prosthetic, also known as all on X. Um, acrylic hybrids contain a titanium bar, which is surrounded by acrylic resin and teeth. There are a variety of options, materials options for screw retained all on X today, and we'll mention some briefly. However, in the interest of time, we'll focus on acrylic hybrid as our screw retained all on X, or rather our fixed all on X option. So, you have a patient that comes into your office who wants implants, they say, which today seems to mean full arch implant supported or implant retained prosthetic. How do you even get started on this case? What are the most important factors that you have to use when you're evaluating the patient and what decisions do you need to make and where do you start? I kind of like that saying a lot, when you have it, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I feel like that's especially relevant in all on X. Most of us seem to have our go-to treatment methodology or materials as a lab person. And there's nothing wrong with having a procedure that I know works. But I think more than any other kind of treatment that we deal with in dentistry, all on X, full arch, we have the greatest amount of patient variation. And so I think that we need to have several tools in our toolbox so that way we have the right thing for each of the patients that we're addressing. And um, so we're going to look at both ways of evaluating the cases and then um, some good options for 
different situations that develop. So there are three important questions that we have to answer for each patient to select the best option. So these questions do interact with each other. So we'll cover each question individually, then discuss how our answers work together to help us choose a treatment plan. So first we need to decide whether we're gonna use a fixed or a removable restoration. There are a few components to this question. First, we need to understand what our patients want. Generally, removable restorations are simpler to clean, but fixed restorations are simpler to wear. While there seems to be a bias towards fixed restorations, honestly, in the current mass marketing, studies have found that patients who get to wear both, where they have a removable prosthetic made for them and a fixed prosthetic made for them, are split about 50-50 between the prosthetics. So obviously, we can't totally build our treatment plan based on the patient's initial thought about what they want, but we, we should definitely take that into consideration. And the second part of this, which is perhaps even more important, is your clinical assessment of the, how your patient got to their current dental situation. If you look at the patient and you say, the reason that their teeth are in the shape that they are is because of poor hygiene, you're probably gonna to wanna to consider a removable solution. Patients who have lifetime habits of poor hygiene may not be willing or able to change. Um, because there's a very, we'll talk about this as we go along, but there are huge differences in how, how easy or difficult to clean a fixed restoration is as opposed to a removable restoration even both, if both are well executed on a laboratory and a clinical level. However, if you're looking at the case and you're saying, you know what, the person is taking good care of their teeth, they just have bruxism or systemic disease, um, either might be appropriate. And so you might look at something else. For instance, if you're dealing with a bruxer, you might say, you know what, I need a zirconia restoration in this because I need something strong to resist the, um, resist the occlusal forces that you know are there. Finally, you need to look at the current gingival position and see if the crest of the ridge is visible at the high, at the Duchenne smile position. If so, you're gonna to need to perform alveoplasty for a fixed restoration, or you'll need to use a flange, and a flange requires, of course, removable restoration. You never want the transition line, this is really important, uh, the, which is the line between the prosthetic and the gingiva to show when the patient smiles. This is an aesthetic nightmare. Uh, I have a, I didn't put the slide in, but I have a slide about this and it just looks terrible. Looks like the person has a gash right across the center of their face. So if you can't, if they have a super gummy smile, you may be forced to do a removable restoration because you can't renew, remove enough bone to hide that uh, transition line. Um, one of the things we also need to understand is in 2023, we have fixed restorations, I mean, removable restorations that are just as stable, stable as a fix. So it used to be, on the one hand, I could have a a very sturdy restoration, but it'd have to be screw retained. On the other hand, I could have something that was a little bit mobile, but was easier to clean. So um, we'll talk about the stability of each type of restoration as we go along here. The second major consideration in all on X is restorative space. Uh, we, we need to start with a definition of restorative space because you're gonna hear several in widespread use. I believe the most common one, the one I wanna to use today, is the distance between the implant platform, usually at the crest of the ridge, to the occlusal plane. If you can only measure, in other words, if the patient, uh, you're examining them with the gingiva in place, um, you can only measure from the tissue to the crest of the ridge, of the, the tissue to the occlusal plane, add two millimeters to your measurement as an approximation to get to true restorative space. As you know, patients with implant-supported restorations lose most of their proprioception. As studies have shown, this leads to significantly higher occlusal loads on all on X restorations than on natural teeth. Because they must resist this increased force, the strength of the final restoration is paramount for success with all on X. 
And the amount of restorative space, just like with a Toronto Bridge case, it's available, dictates the thickness of the restoration and thus the strength of the prosthesis. A decision to start a case with inadequate restorative space will lead to regular prosthetic breakage and long-term frustration for both you and the patient. Restorative space also has a large effect on the cost of the restoration. If your patient wants a screw retained hybrid, she or he will need 15 millimeters of restorative space. For most patients, this will require alveoplasty and thus the surgical component of their case will be much more costly. If you can restore the case with the restorative space already present, you can make the case much simpler and more affordable. If the patient has existing implants, restorative space is also an important factor. Usually, existing implants will only have enough restorative space for an overdenture prosthetic, if even that. If the patient wants a fixed prosthetic, any existing implants often have to be surgically removed, although there are fixed materials like zirconia that can be used with limited restorative space. So when you're thinking about your restorative space, one of the things you want to think about is lost BDO. Many of our all on patients have lost videos, they've lost teeth and bone. And so your assessment of restorative space needs to go both ways, basically. You need to look at where do I need to put the bone, but you also need to look at where should the plane of occlusion be? You know, if we have a patient who's like our right hand image, this person may have lost, you know, four or five millimeters of vertical space due to attrition or um, abrasion or whatever. And so we, we want to give that space back, which also gains us restorative space without doing bone reduction. And uh, you can kind of see how one of the things that's cool about All on X is that we can give the person a bit of a facelift with, um, with, our, uh, with our restoration. Um, some of you will have seen the Conmeteor instrument and similar ones that, are, that can be used. I know a lot of people who use those, but uh, we're going to talk about kind of briefly the old school way of doing this. So a quick way to assess the video is get the patient to sit up in the chair. And a lot of times it can be helpful to take their, if they have dentures, to take those dentures out. Ask them to swallow and relax their jaw. You need to have a couple of fixed points on the nose and the chin and take a measurement between those. When you can get a repeatable measurement, that's your vertical dimension of rest and you can subtract three millimeters of that for the VDO. Then have the person close on their prosthetics and subtract the measurement you get between those points there. That tells you how much opening you need to get to the right position. All right, so our third major consideration in all NX is implant position and anterior posterior spread. Uh, AP spread, the more common name for it, is the distance from the center of the platform of the most anterior implant to the distal of the platform of the most posterior implant. Most all in X cases that we see today have some posterior cantilever. This slide shows the older notion that I think is still out there, but that, that you could have a posterior cantilever that's one and a half times the AP spread. So this is true from an uh, implant survivability perspective. We know that if we follow that rule and we place appropriate implants, our implants can survive the load from that cantilever. But what we found as more and more of these restorations are out there is it's usually not implant failure that causes problems, it's prosthetic complications. And unfortunately, all the laws of physics that affect our prosthetics are still operative with all on X. So long cantilevers like this, while they can be supported by the implants, tend to have more breakage. You tend to see more with the patient. Um, so today, I would say in 2023, we're trying to cut that posterior cantilever down as much as we can. Another thing to keep in mind is some of the advanced materials that will allow you to restore these restorations with less vertical space do require a short cantilever. For instance, uh, zirconia nano ceramics both want 10 millimeters or less of posterior cantilever, basically in molar. Now you think about this and you think, you know what, this seems like a secondary consideration. Um, but as you dig into these cases, you'll find that you really have to deal with this early. If a patient has existing implants, 
you have to look at those and see how do those affect my AP spread? Am I gonna need to add implants behind them? Because usually the posterior implants are the challenge, not the anterior implants. Because um, so treatment planning with existing implants, you both have to look at how do I get the AP spread I need and how do I get the restorative space spread. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that many of the removable options work best with straight implants. Most of them have a compensation mechanism, if you will, but they're going to work best with straight implants. So if your patient has a lot of bone loss and a pneumatized sinus, you may require, you may have to do uh, sinus lifts to get the implants in the ideal position, which of course delays the treatment and adds cost. Um, AP spread is best diagnosed with the CBCT scan, or at least potential AP spread. So we need to add that to our diagnostic records. All right, so you've assessed those three things and you're like, I'm ready to plan this case out. Um, so the next thing you have to kind of decide is how much surgical intervention is gonna be necessary. Sometimes for a removable option with say two locators, you can use a tissue supported surgical guide, punch the tissue and place parallel implants, which is gonna give you a potentially lower treatment. You can also in those restorations, you know, sometimes do them without bone reduction, which can be helpful. On the other hand, most of the all on X, the fixed cases will require alveoplasty and placement of at least four implants, which is uh, gonna be more costly. And it requires that your patient be healthy enough to undergo the surgery. Last but not least, if you look at the case and you're like, I just can't get 15 millimeters of restorative space, you don't, it, you can't change, you're gonna be eliminating some options that you can't add later. As we'll talk about, restorative space can really only be created on the day of surgery. So, if we decide, well, I can only get 12, then a hybrid isn't an option for that patient because if we choose to do a hybrid, we're just gonna be dealing with breakage and we're making the case, we're setting ourselves up for a lack of success, let's say. So we put it all together, we've decided what uh, course of treatment we're gonna do, we're ready to proceed with, our, with the actual treatment. So this is implied in our discussion of restorative space, but to make it explicit, our full arched cases must be approached from a prosthetically driven perspective. In other words, we can only evaluate, evaluate the bone present, the AP spread and the restorative space if we know the desired final tooth position. Of course, some of our patients will have some teeth and others will have an existing denture. Um, I won't, I'm not gonna go through all the restoration, all the provisionalization methods right now, but, um, Oftentimes, you'll either be doing an immediate or a traditional denture uh, somewhere in this process, especially with some of the uh, freehand options. Uh, so, you, so you have a patient who has a denture and you're trying to decide, is this good enough or do I need another one? I feel like your two basic considerations are tooth position and VDO. If the tooth position and VDO look good or close, you're probably fine. If it's way off, you're probably gonna to wanna to make a new provisional prosthetic because again, you need to have those accurate tooth positions in order to, um, to plan the case properly. Correct tooth contour originates with the incisal edges of eight and nine. One to two millimeters of incisal edge should show with the, lipid, or the upper lip at rest and no more than two millimeters of gingiva should show above the free gingival margin at the high smile or the patient will have a gummy smile. So from that one measurement, because those two measurements give you the length of the central, you can use golden proportion or your favorite pro approximation thereof, somewhere between 72 and 80% to find the rest of the teeth. The width of the central should be 72 to 80% of the length. So that gives you the central. The lateral surface area should be about the same proportion of the central. The mesial aspect of the cuspid should be that same proportion to the lateral. So you can see that we can actually, once we have those two positions, we can develop a full smile from that, which is, uh, of course, very convenient for treatment planning. 
Uh, one thing that's cool about this is that anytime we're doing a case that's supported by implants, we have more freedom in our tooth position. If our patients want a little more lip support, we can move it, especially with removables. With fixed, sometimes if we push the teeth too far buckle off the ridge, let's say we're trying to convert a class three to class one or something like that, we can um, create a bit of a ledge that can be at the apical side that can be uh, difficult for cleaning. Um, we do want to keep in mind that of course, our tooth position also affects phonetics. Like everything in dentistry, we're like trying to get everything to work together. So we want to make sure that we um, are thinking about the wet dry line as well as we're um, as we're positioning those maxillary teeth. Uh, we want our midline, of course, horizontally positioned um, in alignment with the patient's facial midline and perpendicular to the interpupillary and commissural lines. If you look at those lines, or maybe they're even their nose, and you say, you know what? I don't have a clear facial midline. You want to make sure you discuss that with the patient and show it in your provisional so that way there's no disappointment later on. My teeth don't look straight. Sometimes it's a little bit challenging to figure out what straight in quotation marks look like for a given patient. There are a few other things you can look at. Most of the time your laboratory will be dealing with this, but this is good for you guys to know when you're evaluating the case. Uh, in general, we want the centrals flat to the front. We want the centrals flat when we look at them straight on. We also, if we're looking at them from the incisal edge, we want them mostly flat or just slightly following the curve. We want our cross arch symmetry, um, so our contralateral teeth are the same. And then there's some kind of rules about uh, gingival and incisal length. Generally, your cuspids and your centrals will have the same incisal length, and your laterals will be about a half millimeter shorter. Gingivally, you kind of see the same. Um, for people with a more exaggerated smile line, sometimes you'll kind of want to follow that lip. So you, you need to make that decision as well. Um, cuspid contour, the mesial aspect of the cuspid can be a little bit difficult um, because sometimes we want to make the cuspids look a little bit, let's say, pointier. And so we open up a little more negative space around there. And sometimes we'll tend to close that down a little bit. I feel like that's one of the hardest parts of uh, smile design is getting that cuspid shape right. One thing that a lot of technicians will sometimes miss is that he should be convex in all dimensions on the labial surface, both the fusal or gingival and mesial or distal. If you have a tooth that looks weird, look at it from the in profile view and you'll sometimes see that there's a big concavity. You're like, okay, found my problem. Um, you also need to decide about uh, functional occlusion on these cases. If we're using acrylic in general, we'll have better results if we do a denture style occlusion, like maybe lingualized posterior occlusion or balanced occlusion. Um, and we sometimes don't want to do cuspid rise on these cases, even though the implants will support it because we can overload uh, the prosthetic. So most of the time you're going to be placing some implants. Um, we're going to talk about the number and position of the implants as we talk about the different restorative options, but there's a few rules to consider. First, I think most of the folks on the call are in general dentistry, and so you're the quarterback for the treatment. Um, your surgeon oftentimes will be uh, doing the first stage of the treatment, but you want to make sure that you provide good prosthetic guidance so that when you get the implants, you're, you have what you need to create the result that you need. Um, like we talked about before, restorative space can only be captured or hiding the transition line on the day of surgery. So we need to make sure we know how much alveoplasty has to be done. Again, if you can help your surgeon with uh, something like our little clear denture template here to show where the implants need to be or um, how much bone reduction needs to be done. There are also fully guided options that will help with that. <coughs> um, you need to decide what to do, like we talked about with any existing implants, um, and kind of plan that ahead of time. You'll want to talk about what kind of restoration you're going to do. If you're going to do a two implant locator case, if you place, if you have the implants placed parallel, then all the parts that the patient has to change over the years will last longer than if they're not parallel. So um, 
So that's something to really think about. If you're doing an all on X case, you're probably going to want to tilt those back implants to get as much AP spread as possible. Um, and last but not least, you want to think about the implant brand. Um, depending on the type of restoration you're doing, some may have um, more favorable components than others. So again, implant brand maybe isn't one size fits all. You may want to have an option for your removable option for your removable cases, another one for fixed. Um, one nice thing about the kind of restorations we're talking about is that you don't really have to be as concerned about what size implant goes in what space. We want the biggest implant we can get, regardless of where it is. If it's in the lower anterior and we can get a five millimeter implant in there, I mean, usually you can't, but if you could, that'd be great. Um, if you're doing an FP1, which is a full arch fixed case where the patient sees the their gingiva still, you do have to get really ideal implant positions, but that's kind of a separate topic that we're not really going to dig into today. Just wanted to kind of put it on the radar. Most of the time, you're going to be using an abutment with these cases. I have three different samples here. For the uh, fixed solutions, you'll usually be doing a um, some kind of multi-unit abutment is shown on the left. Oftentimes, your surgeon will deliver these, and the goal is to straighten out the tilted implant. So in other words, if you know you're going to be tilting the implant quite a lot in the posterior, you want to tilt it at 30 degrees because there's a 30 degree abutment to correct that. Um, so when you're doing all on X, you usually be working restoratively to the abutments. With uh, resilient attachments or conus cases, you're going to be working at the fixture level. Uh, that will help a little bit with cost um, because the Final restorative abutment is takes the place of the transmucosal abutment. So, um, but when you're thinking about these workflows, fixed you'll be working to an MUA, removable you'll generally be working direct to fixture. So, you have a prosthetic that that shows kind of where you're headed, a provisional prosthetic and you understand your patient, you understand their history, and you're ready to decide if a fixed or removal restoration would be more appropriate. Um, if you're trying to do something without alveoplasty, again, you're usually looking at a removable restoration. Um, I was looking for some studies on this, and they're difficult to find, but the one I found said that by our definition of restorative space, most denture wearers have nine and a half millimeters of space. Um, so really, there aren't a lot, any sturdy restorations that are at that. If you can get to 11, 11 and a half, though, with a bite opening, if you've lost some vertical, or perhaps even with just localized recessing of the implants a little bit, all of a sudden, you do have space for a removable option. Again, like we talked about, uh, your fixed options will usually require some alveoplasty. So we're going to start out by talking about resilient uh, attachments, which work like snaps on a shirt. You're going to see a lot of different ones in your practice. Um, you can see I have an ERA attachment on the left, a ball attachment in the middle, and a locator on the left. I would say that the locator is the most prevalent and probably the most successful of these. And one of the things we want to think about when we're treating our patients, especially our younger patients, is that they are going to have these restorations for a long time, and these removable restorations require a little bit of maintenance. So if they move or if they're working with another clinician, the more common a component we use, like a locator, the easier it makes things for them to get the parts and to, for their clinicians to do the service that they need on these restorations. So locator, again, that's how you use up your 11.25 millimeters of space. Um, we're going to talk about that as kind of our archetypal uh, snap restoration. Locators have a male and female component that snap together. The male component is the abutment, which is affixed to the implant with a screw and torque to the implant manufacturer specification. So even though locators look the same, when you torque them, You'll want to torque them based on your implant manufacturer's abutment torque specifications, 
locator won't provide those specs for you because again they did let's say from a neodent to a noble biocare they're going to use different torque specs um the female component of this or rather the, sorry the, the the male component is embedded in the prosthetic and that can be done in the laboratory or in the office we'll kind of talk about both workflows so this is a usually a less costly option on day one but it's going to require more maintenance as the person goes along um, the little insert that's shown in blue here needs to be replaced every six months or so and if you're only doing a two implant prosthetic you'll probably need to do relines as well. So, and, and I would say this is a good general rule. In general, the less expensive the restoration is up front, the longer, the, the more expensive the lifetime maintenance will be. And I think that this is something that's really important to talk with with your patients. Sometimes there's a feeling that, well, I'm just spending this money and then I never need to go to the dentist again. And you're like, no, that's not the case. And so make sure you talk about both ongoing cost and time for maintenance for your patients so that they can, um, you know, get the most benefit out of the, the prosthetic that you're providing. So if a patient has an existing denture that works well, especially a lower denture, and you're like, they're like, this thing flops around, I just want to do whatever's the least expensive option to get some stability. Um, Probably the best thing that you can do for them from a cost perspective is to place two implants in uh, in the anterior position. So back in the day, we used to put these implants in the cuspid position, but what we discovered is that then we had an anterior and a posterior cantilever that would create a rock. This may be counterintuitive for some of you, but um, in general with these cases, we want to place the implants in the lateral position or just distal lateral position. We want the implants to be in as close to a straight line as possible. That way we only have cantilever in one dimension. Um, you can also plan these cases for potential conversion to an all on act. So if you're looking at restorative space and you do a little bit of localized alveoplasty and place the implants a little bit deeper, then you can tell a patient, okay, well, we We've stabilized your denture a little bit and we've set up your case so that we can add a couple more implants and get you something really stable if you decide to go that direction. Um, one of the newer advances with locators is both, I mentioned here the angled ones, but also the um, they have some little sit on multi-unit abutments. So again, locators can deal with up to 30 degrees of divergence between the implants or even more with the extended range components but keep in mind the more divergence the more difficult it is to put the restoration in and out which the patient needs to do every day and um the more wear you'll see on the components the sooner it'll get loose and the person will need to come in for maintenance um you can also places we're showing on the right here four parallel implants and get a a, a Removable restoration that's fairly sturdy. There's even a new option that just came out this year called Locator Fix that allow you to deliver a fixed restoration with those four implants. Um, I don't want to go into a huge discussion on this, but as you guys know, internally loaded bone re remains and externally loaded bone resorbs. And so with a um, two locator case, because a lot of the bone is being loaded externally by the prosthetic, you'll see more resorption than you do with the other options. Uh, this shows that angled locator that I was talking about that can be used to compensate. Um, the other thing we, we can talk about is bar supported removable restorations. Um, this is another interesting thing I found in getting ready for this presentation. I always thought, oh, those would be better because you get cross arch stabilization. You're not individually loading each implant. But a 2019 Italian medicine study that was in the International Journal of Prosthodontics reports that when you look at a four locator bar case, let's say, as opposed to four individual locators, the failure rate is higher with the bar cases for implants. And uh, they believed it was because the hygiene is so much more difficult. So again, you know, getting us back to what we talked about at the beginning, understanding your patient's hygienic ability and um, 
designing the prosthetic accordingly makes a big difference. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is locator bars require that 15 millimeters of space. So a lot of times you're going to have to do albioplasty for those. So let's say you're going to order a locator button. What do you need to know? Of course, you need to know the brand line and size of the implants that you'll be restoring. And of course, you'll need a prosthetic driver and torque wrench for that system. Um, but then when you're selecting the locator, you're going to want to remove the healing abutment with your appropriate driver and then measure the highest point of the gingiva, as you can see on the left there, with your perio probe, and then order based on that. The locator abutment itself builds in another millimeter and a half, so you just order based on the cuff height. Um, if always round up with this measurement because if the um, if the roll part of the locator is subgingival, it interferes with the seating of the prosthetic and can make it less stable for the, your patient. You can see there's a little tool there on the right that you can use to kind of compare angulation if you want to decide what kind of, uh, whether you need the normal range or the extended range attachments. Um, once you've taken that measurement, you can uh, take, if you're doing, you're ready to do your final restoration, you can take a steady impression for a custom tray or an immediate denture if you need either of those. So the next, so if you're doing locators, next thing you have to decide is if you want to cure them yourself or if you want to cure them in the lab. Um, generally, it's up to you. If you like doing them, feel free, of course. But um, doing four locators at the same time can be a little bit difficult. Generally, what we would recommend is if you're curing them into an existing denture, then you'll want to go ahead and cure those in the mouth. Otherwise, you'll probably want to take an impression. And so you'll see this thing in the middle of the page here. That's a locator impression code. You can see on the right how those are snapped onto the locator attachments and then picked up in the master impression. Uh, you want to make sure you syringe lots of material around this because it needs to be picked up. It is a closed tray technique, which is nice. Um, generally with these restorations, you're gonna be having borders. So you wanna do border molding and uh, that sort of thing to get a really accurate removal restoration. And then you'll go ahead and send that to your laboratory with your posing. Uh, once you have your locator abutments in place, it's best to just leave them in place. So uh, make sure you relieve the patient's provisional so that it uh, seats well. So if you're gonna cure it chair side, you'll take the actual final housings, which are these silver things here in the number one position and put the black processor attachments in, the little processing ring, and then set it uh, make sure they snap on your locators. Uh, use some kind of PIP or something like that to see where the uh, where the housings fit and hollow it out. You have to make sure that the prosthetic sits passively with all the housings in place. A lot of times it's nice to cut a little vent hole through from the lingual. Then you want to use some injectable self-curing PMMA resin, not a uh, it's best not to do biz GMA materials because they don't, they only adhere by mechanical retention, not by chemical retention. So then you, um, as it shows in the picture here, you squirt a little bit around the housing and a little bit inside the denture, seat it down, clean the material out, and you're good to go. Uh, you're, you'll need to remove the black processor and put in the correct retentive housing with your three-in-one tool. Um, you can do this at one appointment. The main thing is you have to do them all at once. You can't do one at a time because otherwise the prosthetic tends to rot. I haven't seen that done successfully yet. So your second appointment, you'll, uh, your, your laboratory will send you a bite block and you'll go ahead and um, try that in, do your normal procedure. Third appointment is going to be your try-in if you're using the laboratory procedure. Um, none of these are going to have an attachment in them. They'll just be like a denture. Uh, a normal denture. Um, and then your final will be your delivery. So when your laboratory processes the, uh, the prosthetic, the locator prosthetic, what they'll actually do is they'll, 
they'll uh, process to those male housings that'll sit on analogs that came from those impression copings you took a long time ago. So that the housings will be cured in with the same resin that the prosthetics made out of. So when you do this procedure, all you have to do is snap the case in, into place. Um, Zest does make a locator scan body. It's kind of cool, but I don't really consider this a fully digital process because in the laboratory, we can't position an analog from the scan body. All it does is it basically makes a space for you to do keratocyte curing for a digital denture. So I'm kind of waiting for a scan body that'll let us put analogs in, in the laboratory. Um, we talked about uh, locator fixed. Um, another removable solution is CONUS. Um, this also is best used with four implants. With CONUS, the way it works is that that little gold cap has an interference fit with the titanium CONUS abutment. So when the patient seeps the prosthetic, they get a mechanical retention to each other. These are very stable. When they're down, they're just as stable as a fixed case, but the patient can remove it and actually needs to remove it a couple times a day. Um, Conus cases can be done with a cantilever 1.5 times AP spread if you want. It's better to go a little bit shorter. Um, it is a more complex workflow. If any of you are interested in finding out about this, uh, reach out to me. I have a little presentation about it. It's a, it's a thing all in, in and of itself. So let's talk about, so we talked about removable solutions and acrylic. So let's talk about fixed uh, acrylic options. Uh, acrylic hybrid is the most common. Um, this is what Dr. Mallow delivered when he first invented the all -on x procedure. Uh, so you use a CAD CAM titanium bar today. It's directly affixed to the multi-unit abutment with screws in the office. The bar supports milled PMMA teeth and both the teeth of the bar are surrounded by acrylic. Uh, sometimes these are called wraparound bars because of the design of the acrylic. Um, like all denture tooth and acrylic solutions, it can fail either due to staining or when teeth break out. Um, the titanium bar should last the rest of the patient's life. The acrylic sometimes doesn't. Um, there's a procedure called a retread to replace all the acrylic. So you need to talk to your patient about that. And also you should retain the patient's provisional. Most of the time patients will have a screw retain provisional with these cases. And um, you'll want to have something. So if you need to have a repair done on the case, it's possible. These prosthetics require 15 millimeters of restorative space, but can have 1.5 times AP spread for the distal cantilever. Um, one thing I want to point out is if you look at the bottom right picture, see how there's a bit of a flange? This is a good example of what not to do. When you see these cases, you want the intaglio surface to be flat or convex so your patients can keep it clean. So when you're doing uh, one of these cases at your first appointment, you'll do a series of photos and then we need an open tray impression of all the MUAs and the opposing, and of course, prescription and bite. Uh, your lab will make a master model with uh, analogs and soft tissue, and then they'll make a, um, or print it if you want, they'll make what's called a verification jig and a screw retaining bite block. When you get the case back, the first thing you want to do is use the verification jig. This is a prosthetic device to verify that the model and the mouth are the same before we make an, an expensive prosthetic. So most of the time we're using MUAs, we'll want to do what's called a modified Sheffield test, which is tighten all the screws, then remove all but one. The prosthetic should seat passively on all the, all the sites. If it doesn't, you need to cut it and loot the pieces together with some kind of really sturdy resin. I think this uses GC resin, but Anything that'll stick is good. Again, if it doesn't stick to the verification jig, that's a problem. Um, then you'll remove this, put your bite block in. Again, usually it's screw retain and do your normal bite verification. So your lab will get the case back, mount it up, and they'll make a mock-up of the final restoration, either out of milled PMMA or denture tea set in wax. Some labs only do one or the other. Some labs do both. Make sure you talk to your lab about what you like. One thing that's nice about the milled one is that you can actually send the patient home with it. Her doctors call that a test drive. So that can be a good option for you. So when you get that case back, 
you want to be really picky at this triangle because the lab is going to do the best they can to duplicate exactly that triangle with the final restoration. So you want to look at phonetics, aesthetics, your vertical, uh, cheek biting, buckle corridor, um, of course, all the aesthetics. Um, if you want any changes made, please take the same series of photos, uh, relaxed lip, high smile profile, so that your laboratory can uh, make any necessary adjustments. If it's a small adjustment, you can oftentimes go to finish. If you need large adjustments, move the midline, change the plane of occlusion, um, reset anterior teeth, then it's probably worth doing another try in. So we always recommend taking a bite over the setup. And so your lab will do a final remount based on that new bite. And then your lab is going to try to exactly duplicate the mock-up. First, that mock-up will be used to guide the positioning of the titanium bar. And the bars are usually ordered from the OEM implant manufacturer. Make sure that your laboratory does that as we do at NDX. Um, once the bar is made, uh, premium teeth or milled PMMA teeth will be attached to the bar. And um, you can either do a try-in with those teeth in place and wax if you want, or you can go straight to finish. Case is finished by injecting resin around the teeth in the bar. So then your final appointment is a delivery. Um, if you follow the steps precisely, this usually goes pretty quick. Uh, you may have to make a slight occlusal adjustment, but usually this is kind of a fun appointment. Um, you're mostly going to want to focus on home care. Um, I've heard people say a good way to present uh, maintenance visits is to talk about if you bought a Mercedes, you take it in for oil changes. And that's maybe a good story to tell your patients about the maintenance that you need to know. It's gotten to where most offices don't remove these unless necessary. So there's no six month remove it, but you do need to have the patient come in for hygiene because. Um, the intaglio of these, if it gets full of bad stuff, it can lead to inflammation and bone loss and implant loss. Um, these are really cool. This last thing I want to say, when you do one of these cases, the first one's a little bit difficult, but everyone says, oh, this will change your life, that'll change your life. These do change people's lives. They're crying. It's the coolest thing ever. You and your team getting to be there for the delivery of the final prosthetic it's very motivating, so I, I would strongly recommend that. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for, um, for joining up, and uh, we'll look forward to doing another one next month.